Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This is an approximate simulation of the future of the Martian moon Phobos. It is slowly spiraling in towards the planet, and once it gets close enough, the gravitational tidal effect will tear the moon apart. So this is performed in a program called Space Sim. It's something that uh, is uses smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, and uh, what it does is it treats the body as actually a collection of small balls that bounce off of each other. And this means that you can not only simulate the orbit of the macroscopic body, but of the individual forces on each part of the body and then have it get torn apart. Now, the reason why I want to make this simulation is because there's a couple of interesting papers that have come up in the last few months that involve asteroids getting torn apart tidally by a parent body, creating ring systems and then potentially moons. One of which is about how the moons of Phobos and Deimos formed around Mars, and another is proposing that the Earth once had a planetary ring. So Mars has two small moons, Phobos and Deimos. They're both about the size of asteroids. Phobos is closer in, it's about uh, 22 kilometers across, irregularly shaped, it's about 6,000 kilometers above the surface, and it orbits the planet in a, in like a, th a fraction of a day. Deimos is smaller, it's about 12 kilometers across. It orbits further away, about 23,000 kilometers, and its orbital period is longer than a Martian day. Now, they're both tidally locked to Mars, and because of interactions between the rotation of the planet and the tidal effect, Phobos is getting pulled down closer, and Deimos is getting pushed away further. But that means about 50 million years from now, Phobos will get close enough that the, it'll be inside the Roche limit, and the body will become elongated due to the tidal effects. Initially, we will see rocks and stuff getting pulled off, but the whole body will begin to deform and crumble. And as it does so, the deformation will accelerate, larger chunks will begin to fall off, and essentially, the whole thing will get stretched out into one elongated object that will spread as the different parts follow different orbits, and we get a ring forming. But this same tidal disruption process may also be relevant to how the moons were formed in the first place. Now, given that Mars is right next to the asteroid belt, it's natural to assume that perhaps they are just captured asteroids. After all, they look a lot like asteroids. In fact, the first photograph of anything that was that size was a photo of Phobos, which was taken by you know, one of the Mariner spacecraft. But anybody that knows Kepler's laws will tell you that as an asteroid falls in towards Mars, it will just swing back out on the same hyperbolic trajectory. It won't slow down. To have an object get captured, you need a three-body problem. So here's an example with two objects that are sort of in orbit around each other. They swing past, and one of them gets captured into a pretty eccentric orbit around Mars. But it turns out gravity is kind of weak. It's actually more efficient if objects have a more direct interaction to bring themselves into orbit. For example, they can actually collide with each other, and if their velocities cancel out, you could be in, you could end up with a single object, which is, well, a bit more angry now, throwing out debris, but in a captured orbit around Mars. Now, you can model this and come up with all sorts of plausible ways for how Phobos and De Deimos were created by this process, but there's an important thing to realize, and that's Phobos and Deimos are in very low inclination orbits relative to the parent body. And if you have random asteroids coming in from the asteroid belts, they're going to be with all sorts of random inclinations. And you wouldn't naturally expect this. And so there was a recent paper published which used NASA supercomputer facilities to model a, a more indirect version of creating Phobos and Deimos. And the idea is you start with a single asteroid coming near Mars and it gets torn apart by the gravitational field. Now, so now after this extreme close encounter, some of the fragments are going to remain on orbits which are captured by Mars, and they're going to form themselves into an, a very eccentric ring system, and it's probably not going to be aligned with the axis of rotation of Mars, because it's come in from a random direction. So now the next stage in this formation process is that the gravitational forces of the Sun and Mars, even Jupiter, they are going to twist these orbits up and kick them into higher inclinations so that the planes of the orbits are no longer intersecting. Also, Mars will be have a, an oblateness factor, which will cause objects near in to twist and precess around it, just like the Earth. 
Now that they're up and they're all different planes, guess what? These orbits are all crossing each other. And that means that some of the particles are naturally going to collide with each other, creating smaller fragments of rock. So now if you have a cloud of objects orbiting around a parent body, what will tend to happen is the orbiting distribution will collapse down into a disk. Anything that is going up with it collides with something going down will have their sort of vertical velocities cancelled and they will find a natural plane in which to sort of collapse down to. So this is how disks form, accretion disks, uh, ring planes, that kind of stuff. And then a rotating planet is oblate and so the, the fact that it's fatter around the equator will tend to twist the orbits of anything which isn't aligned with the equator. So ring systems on planets will naturally sort of collapse down into the same equatorial plane as the planet in question. So yeah, those colliding fragments, they form a ring which is kind of like an accretion disk from which new objects can form. Once the dust is settled into a disk, you've essentially removed the vertical velocity component. So the encounter velocities between the objects is lower. And that means instead of smashing when they hit, they tend to stick together. The objects will begin to accrete from this disk and that's why you end up with a pair of moons in the same plane as the equator of Mars. So this isn't necessarily a new idea by any means, but what it's showing is that using the supercomputer they showed that the orbits can get pumped up into these different inclination orbits. They can then collide and then you can have a ring forming. And again, this is a sort of simulation of something in space sim. It's not really to scale by any means, but it does kind of show objects that are in a common ring accreting mass. And uh, yeah, yeah, you can see that it picks colors based upon which objects are roughly the same thing. So as objects collide, they choose a common color. And sure, it absolutely lacks the fidelity of these amazing supercomputer simulations. But the fact that I can run this kind of stuff on my PC and watch, you know, worlds being created, worlds accreting uh, in a hypothetical past, is a, it's rather hypnotic and I love messing around with these kind of simulations. And you might notice that while we've got a few macroscopic bodies uh, far out, there is a ring of material in there that is just not accreting. And that's because it's inside the Roche limit, right? It's getting pulled apart by tidal forces before it can form into anything larger. And in this particular simulation, we ended up with two large bodies out there, one in a highly eccentric orbit that eventually came in close, had a grazing encounter, and was then kicked into an orbit which brought it inside the Roche limit, whereupon it was torn apart mercilessly by gravitational forces. Uh, you'll notice that it actually kicks a whole bunch of material out far enough that the larger body could potentially have uh, encounters and start collecting some of this excess material. Again, not scientific, but very enjoyable to watch. So now the other paper that I was talking about, it uh, suggests that the Earth at one point had a planetary ring. And this story actually got picked up by a lot of the mainstream press. I mean, who doesn't love the idea of standing on Earth and looking up and seeing a cool ring above your heads? So this paper comes from geologists, and they start out by looking at a number of asteroid impact craters during a 40 million year period. It's called the, the Ordovician Impact Spike, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but it's an era where apparently there's a lot more asteroid impacts than are expected. This is also associated with an increase in the amount of chondrite material which is found in sediments. And so they were interested in reconstructing where on the Earth these impacts took place when you account for tectonic drift. Now, they have, obviously, this is uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. They had to find areas of the world where the stuff had been preserved from that era. And then you have to apply tectonic drift models to figure out where the, the land was at that particular time. And according to their analysis, they believe that all the big impact sites are happening very close to the equator, within like plus or minus 30 degrees. So given that most of the impacts happened along the equator, their argument was that the impacts are from bodies which were in a ring system around the Earth at low inclination that fell in over you know, 40 million years and created these impact craters primarily close to the equator. And again, they start out with an object coming in on a hyperbolic orbit, 
getting torn apart and then forming a debris cloud which collapses into a disk which then is dropping material onto the earth. And I actually think that that's a fine explanation for the increase in the chondrite layer, but I'm not actually happy with it as an explanation for why these large craters are all along the equator. Because it's not enough to just have the disk of material, you need to have a mechanism by which the objects get slung down into the Earth. They can't just spiral down slowly because then they'll just break up due to gravitational forces or they'll impact with low angles and you won't generate these big craters. You need some force that will you know, increase the eccentricity of the orbit so that when they do impact the Earth, they come down sufficiently steeply that they're not, produ they're not breaking up on descent or producing highly elliptical craters. That part of the dynamics hasn't been solved at this point. And you could absolutely argue that the moon very likely could have had something to do with this, but the paper also says that they don't have any evidence of a spike in the cratering rate on the moon at this era. And if the moon was involved in kicking asteroids down to impact the Earth, you would expect a similar number of collisions with the moon. So at this point, I don't think they've done a great job at linking the impact craters to a hypothetical ring. But the scenario is totally plausible, it's just they've not really explicitly made that link. They need to do a lot more work. But if you're a fan of the idea of the Earth with the ring, take heart from the fact that in the long and cataclysmic history of the formation of the solar system, there has been very likely many eras when there were rings of debris around the Earth. And, for example, when the moon was formed, very likely that process left behind a substantial amount of debris that uh, would have persisted for a while, except that the Earth was molten lava, so you probably wouldn't have had the joy of looking up into the ring around the Earth. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.